Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Years ago, a prominent minister in Los Angeles was holding special gospel meetings in his church. Among those attending that night was a gentleman obviously unacquainted with the program. After a few meetings, the preacher made a special point of speaking to, to him and discovered that he was not a believer. What do you think of Christianity? The preacher asked. The visitor said, oh, Christianity is very interesting as far as it goes, but I could never be a Christian. The minister asked, why? He said, because I could never believe that I could get salvation from a dead Jew. And the preacher said, neither do I. And he said, oh, yes, you do. Don't you claim, don't you Christians claim that salvation comes through the death of Christ? The preacher said, yes, but not through his death alone, but also because Christ rose from the dead. He's not a dead Jew. He's a living Savior. The visitor said, ah, he could never prove that to me. That began a long and interesting discussion. The preacher brought up argument after argument for the resurrection, even the fact that Christ appeared to 500 people at once after he arose. But it was all to no avail. The gentleman held to his position. Realizing his arguments had failed to convince him, the preacher said this, but I have not given you the most important reason for the resurrection. I know that Christ is living because he lives in me. The man asked, what do you mean by that? For the next hour, the preacher told him what Christ meant to him, how he had changed his life. Before they parted, they agreed to meet again, and they prayed together. Reaching his home that night, the minister, Pastor A.H. Ackley, slipped into his study and penned some well-known lines. The next morning, he set them to music, and thus was born one of our best-known gospel songs, which so well emphasizes the fact and the truth that he lives. Pastor Ackley wrote this, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. John 20 verses 1 to 2 read, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Desiring to complete the job that was done in haste on the eve of the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene came early on Sunday morning to anoint the Lord's body. Mark 16, 9 says of Mary, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Mary had been possessed by seven demons, but the Lord in his mercy and because of his authority over demons as their creator, he cast those seven devils out of her. Out of her gratitude to him for delivering her from the bondage of Satan. From that point on, Mary was completely devoted to Christ to follow and to serve him. And Mary is a good reminder to us too how we, having been delivered by Christ from the bondage of sin and from Satan's kingdom of darkness, how we should, like Mary, we should follow and be devoted to our Savior simply out of deep gratitude for our deliverance. Magdalene wasn't Mary's last name. Instead, being called Mary Magdalene tells us where Mary was from. Mary was from a village called Magdala in Galilee, which was located on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. After feeding the 4,000, it says of the Lord in Matthew 15, 39, and he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. 
Being from this village of Magdala, Mary was a Magdalene. It's like us who live in Wisconsin, how we are called Wisconsinites. Mary followed the Lord to the cross. She watched both from a distance and she also came close to the cross with the Lord's mother. With Mary, the mother of Joseph, Mary Magdalene watched when the Lord was being prepared for burial and she saw where he was buried. And then she came to the tomb early on resurrection morning with the other women. As Mark 16, 1 says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. As Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb when it was yet dark, she saw the disc-shaped heavy stone that sealed the entrance in an odd position. In verse 1, we find that she sees the stone taken away. Luke 24, 3 tells us that she entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus with the other women. And finding that the Lord's body wasn't there, it's at this point that Mary immediately takes off and runs to tell the disciples, leaving the other women in the empty tomb. John only deals with Mary Magdalene and not the other women. But Luke tells us how after Mary left, the angels appeared to the remaining women and gave them the blessed message that Christ was risen, just as he said. Mary runs and finds Peter and John, probably still breathless from running. She tells them the startling news. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. The words taken away in verse 2 is translated from the exact same word describing the position of the entrance stone. She told the disciples that someone carried off, carried away the Lord's body from the tomb. The reason she ran to tell the disciples was that she thought someone stole the Lord's body or took the body, moved it to another location. It didn't cross Mary's mind that Christ might have risen from the dead. The word they is not defined when she says they have taken away the Lord. She might have been thinking about the Romans, that the Roman soldiers or Roman rulers might have taken his body. Or perhaps she was thinking of the enemies of the Lord, the Jewish religious leaders. The interesting thing is, though, that these Jewish leaders would later accuse the disciples of stealing the Lord's body. And Mary's thought well, it might have been that the Jewish leaders had stolen the body. Everybody's pointing fingers when the truth was that Christ was alive. John 20, verses 3 to 8 read, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Before we explain these verses, there's a couple things we need to discuss about how Christ was buried. First, regarding the Lord's grave clothes, John 19, 39-40 teaches, And there came also Nicodemus, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is, to bury. The Jews' manner for burial was for the body to be wound very tightly in clean white linen strips of cloth. Spices were mixed in between the various wraps to help the cover of the odor of the decaying body. One of the spices they used was myrrh when wrapping the body. Myrrh was a sticky substance which would adhere closely to the body and to the grave clothes so that those clothes would not unravel and would, st they would stay tightly woven around the body. The linen clothes were then wrapped around the body a few times in layers and would, would be wound up to the head. The head was wrapped separately, turban fashion often with a flap that could be folded back so the face could be seen during the days of mourning. When Christ raised Lazarus, John 11:44 44 describes it 
And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. After the body preparation was complete, it was a cocoon-like wrapping around the body, which would weigh approximately 100 to 120 pounds. The second thing about the Lord's burial is that the Lord's body was placed in a solid rock tomb. Matthew 27, verse 60 states that the Lord's body was placed in a tomb which had been honed out in the rock. John 19, 41 reads, Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. This passage tells us that the sepulcher where the Lord's body was laid was in a new tomb, in which was never man yet laid, that the tomb was in a garden, and that it was near the, to the place where Christ was crucified. And from the rock tombs that still exist in Jerusalem, we learn that the entrance to these tombs usually had an entrance of around four feet high. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Moses and Paul, The Dispensers of Law and Grace, is a paperback 86-page book written by Pastor Cornelius R. Stamp. Here is a simple approach to dispensational truth that should prove both refreshing and helpful to you in your study of the Word of God. Paul's message and ministry was distinct and separate from that of the Twelve. He was committed to the doctrine and program for a new dispensation, the dispensation of the grace of God. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262 262- 255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. In John's gospel record, such as in verse 3, John referred to himself as that other disciple and in other similar ways. In verses 3 and 4, we learn that Mary's news about the missing body caused Peter and John to head out immediately, and they both ran to the tomb. This was a day for running. John may have been a little younger than Peter, or John was at least a little faster, or John may have been smarter if he knew a shortcut. But regardless of how or why, John makes it very clear that he outran Peter and came first to the tomb in the garden. This is something that John even mentions twice in these verses. He says it again in verse 8. I'm not sure, but this could be a guy thing. We like to race, and we like to be first. In in verses 5 and 6, we find that when John got to the tomb, he approached it reservedly and cautiously, which is like in keeping with John's personality. At the low four-foot entrance of the tomb, John stooped down and looked in. He saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. He was likely uh, considering the defilement under the law caused by touching a dead body and entering a grave. And so the law made John pause. He was sensitive to God's word. Verse 5 says that John saw the linen clothes lying. The Greek word translated as saw is the Greek word blepo, which means to perceive by the use of the eyes. A good example of this word would be when we see a green light at an intersection. You see the light, but you don't give it much thought. You know what you saw, you saw it accurately, and you go. Likewise, when John looked in the tomb, he saw the grave clothes. He knew what he saw. He saw it accurately. He saw the grave clothes, and he didn't see Christ's body, but he didn't look long enough or close enough to see the folded napkin. 
then here comes impulsive Peter <laughs> coming in second in the foot race, but without any hesitation like John, Peter went straight into the tomb. And verse 6 says that Peter seeth the linen clothes lie. The Greek word translated as seeth here is theoro, from which we get our English word theorize. And this Greek word speaks of giving careful notice, to consider, to view attentively. Peter went right into the tomb, right up to the grave clothes, stared at them, studied the, the scene, theorizing what could have possibly happened here. When Lazarus had been raised by the Lord, he had come from the tomb wearing his grave clothes. But as Christ did not need the stone moved to exit the rock tomb, so he had no need to be unwrapped. In Christ's glorified, resurrected body, he was able to pass right through the grave clothes and to leave them there as an empty shell. And Peter stood there considering and theorizing how and why these linen clothes were lying there with no body, pondering why anyone would take the time to remove grave clothes from the Lord's body, or how the body was removed to leave an empty shell like this, as Peter was taking in the whole scene, verse 7 says that he saw the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. The Lord's napkin or face cloth was folded neatly to the side, separate from the rest of the grave clothes. When Lazarus came forth from the grave, it says his face was bound about with a napkin. This napkin used for the Lord's burial had been folded and put to the side. Everything was neat and orderly in the empty tomb. Now again, considering the theory that someone stole the body, why would a grave robber fold a face, face cloth? Why would grave robbers take the time to remove a body from grave clothes? And leaving it in the spices would have been the preferred way to take it. The sticky myrrh, which was used in the burial preparation, would have caused it to be very difficult for the grave clothes to be removed, and it would have taken time. Peter saw the empty grave clothes, undisturbed in their position and form, with the headpiece neatly folded to the side. When Christ arose, he simply stood up, passed right through those grave clothes, and left them there as a proof that he was risen as well as giving monumental testimony to his physical bodily resurrection. But I love the folded napkin. The folded face cloth speaks to me of how the Lord was not in a hurry when he arose. As God in flesh, he was in control of the entire situation. He took the time in that early morning to neatly fold his face cloth before he left. In the quiet of that early morning in that tomb, it is a beautiful thing to picture the Lord folding that napkin. He did so as a proof of his resurrection. And to me, just the visual of that napkin is a picture of comfort that accompanies knowing that Christ is risen and that we have sure hope in him. John now enters after staying outside the tomb for a moment and he comes up beside Peter. And Peter and John stood there staring at the greatest miracle mankind in this world and this universe has ever known. And verse 8 says that John saw and believed. The Greek word translated saw here is eidos, which means to view with comprehension. In other words, the light came on, and John got it. Everything fell into place. Seeing the evidence before him of the empty tomb, the grave clothes, the folded face cloth, John believed at that moment that Christ was risen from the dead. He knew and believed that Christ was alive before he ever saw him. Peter saw more than John did in his first glance, but then John saw more than Peter after he looked again. Peter had more sight, but John had more insight. John saw the meaning 
and was convinced Christ rose from the dead. And I like to think that John turned to Peter and whispered, Peter, he's alive. John 20, verses 9 to 18 read, For as yet they knew not the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not it, that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Even after a long period of teaching by the Lord, and by the Lord even foretelling it, John wrote how they still did not understand that he must rise again from the dead. And they did not understand that Scripture prophesied that he would rise again. John is showing here that their belief in the resurrection preceded their understanding that it was foretold in the Scripture Therefore, this shows that they did not manufacture a resurrection story to agree with the Messianic prophecy. Overwhelmed, Peter and John then went back home to ponder all of this. The first two words of verse 11 are striking, though. But Mary. The other two disciples went home. But Mary. The Lord had done a remarkable thing in her life and she was so grateful and remained grateful and devoted to her Lord even when she thought he was still dead. But Mary, and she returned to the garden. Her grief, her loss drove her back along with being confused over his missing body and as Mary comes back to the tomb she was crying. Standing outside the tomb weeping, she then stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels clothed in white raiment. One was at the head and one at the foot of the grave clothes on the rock ledge where Christ's body had lain. Like how that was put there. The angels asked Mary, why are you weeping? Evidently not knowing they were angels, expressing no fear or surprise, she simply repeated what she had told the disciples, that someone had taken away the Lord's body and she didn't know where it was. She then turned around and Christ was standing there. But she did not know it was Him. Like the angels, the Lord asked her, Why are you weeping? And then He further asked her, Who are you seeking? Mary was asked why she was weeping twice here. Because this was not a day for tears or sorrow that accompanies death because Christ was no longer dead. He was alive. The tomb being in a garden, Mary mistook the Lord for the gardener, the caretaker of the garden. She assumed that being the gardener, he might have known or may have even been the one who took the body, and so she request, requested custody of it if he had it. And then the Lord said, Mary. And she knew that voice. And the moment he spoke her name, Immediately she knew it was him. And it is an overwhelming thought to think how someday in glory, the Lord is going to look at me and say, Kevin. And he's going to look at you and say your name. And turning quickly towards him, Mary says, Rabona, her master, out of sheer joy, and then she grabbed him and embraced him. 
she held on to him, fearing that she would once again lose him. And the Lord told her, touch me not. And the word touch here means to attach. Mary hugged him and touch me not means stop clinging to me. She really latched on. She could not keep the Lord there with her for the time being, he was telling her, because as he told her, he had to ascend to the Father, and thus, you're going to have to let me go, Mary. The Lord sent her back with a message that he was to ascend to his and their Father and his God and their God. It's a wonderful thing to think for believers that the Father is my Father and that God is my God, and we should refer to him like that. I believe the Lord ascended sometime on Resurrection Day between the morning and afternoon, leading captivity captive, or taking the Old Testament saints from paradise in the center of the earth to heaven. Now that Christ's blood had been shed as the full and all-sufficient payment for sin, these saints were welcome in God's presence in the glories of heaven. And it is also likely that what Colossians 2.15 describes took place at this ascension also, having spoiled, that is, demonic principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Mary was delaying the important work Christ had to do on this day. And on this day, the Lord had also appeared to the other woman, women who had come to the tomb, individually to Peter in Jerusalem, to the two on the road to Emmaus, and to ten of the eleven apostles in the upper room. Following the Lord's appearance to her, Mary obeyed the Lord, went to the disciples, told them that she had seen the risen Lord, and she relayed what he asked her to tell them. William Sangster, a deeply spiritual minister who helped guide Londoners through the horrors of the World War II bombings, fell ill to a disease that progressively paralyzed his body and eventually his vocal cords. On the Resurrection Sunday, just before he died, he managed to scribble this short note to his daughter. How terrible to wake up on Easter and have no voice to shout, He is risen. Far worse to have a voice and not want to shout. And what a privilege we have been given and what a joy it is to know and to be able to say every single day that He is risen. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, Write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.